everyone and welcome to yet another episode of And You Read Some The Top Decks! The podcast about memes, internet culture and whatever. Uh, so today is the Halloween special episode. Uh, you've read the title, you know what the fuck is going on. And we are gonna read a scary stories to each other. And uh, that's gonna be really fucking spooky. Steph! Yes. You're probably the most and best prepared of us. We can start with you. All right. I found a couple of spooky stories that um, made me get goosebumps all over. Um, This one is called The New House, and it's a little bit long. And these are allegedly true stories that have happened to people. So. Allegedly. Alleged. I've also found uh, non-fiction. Actually, I found a great Reddit thread. Uh, what are the scariest pages on Wikipedia? I picked a few ones, so it's all real non-fiction. There's also a, a, a really, really scary story about a, a, a virus that is infecting the whole world, and so people have to hide inside their houses. But uh, I don't like to tell it because we're all living it right now. All right, so let's get spooky. This story is called The New House. Just a quick backstory. Almost every house I've ever lived in has had some sort of paranormal goings on, and I've written about two other houses already if you want to check it out. My younger brother, who's 21, has a history of night terrors, and my mum, who's 46, claims to have always been sensitive. I guess it runs in the family or something. I've only told this story a couple of times because it makes me very emotional and trust me, I've gone over all of the possibilities, paranormal or otherwise. When we moved into this house, it was 2013. I was about to start my senior year of high school and my brother, we'll call him Tristan, was about to start eighth grade. At the time, our Yorkie, Tiny, and our Chihuahua, Lucy, had four puppies. Our other dog, Bugsy, is blind and he plays a key role in realising maybe something wasn't right with the house from the very beginning. He would never walk far down the hallway. Every time he would get to the bathroom, he would always stop and back out of the hallway. All of the bedrooms were down the hall past the bathroom. This is important for later. When we moved in, we kept the puppies next to the bathroom in a cardboard box to keep them all in one place, since even though they were newborns, they were starting to learn how to walk a little bit and we didn't want to lose any of them since they were so small. On the morning of the incident, we had probably been living in the house for a few months already. So far, nothing out of the norm has happened and it was actually a huge relief for me. Tristan hadn't been sleepwalking walking, or having night terrors. My mum hadn't heard us calling her name when we weren't there and I wasn't afraid that when the lights were off or when I was taking a shower. That morning, the sun was out and the house was well lit. I walked out of my room to get to the bathroom in the hall so I could get ready for school. My mum was in my way because she was cuddling one of the puppies so I asked her to move so I could get to the bathroom. I was watching her the entire time, so when she put the puppy down, his name was Petey, it came as a shock to me when she stood up really fast and started crying and apologising to me that she dropped him. I told her she didn't drop him because I just watched her put him down. He was fine. He didn't cry or anything and he was placed down, not dropped. Even after trying to reassure her, she picked Petey up again and hurried over to the kitchen island and sat down on the bar stool and cuddled up to him, whispering something over and over. I didn't really think too much of it, since my mum can be quite dramatic at times, so I just kind of brushed it off and continued to get ready for school. When I came into the kitchen to make my lunch, my mum was still sitting at the island cuddling Petey and whispering how sorry she was and that he was going to be okay. I don't remember what I said, but at this point I was being snotty and probably said something along the lines of, you're acting like a crazy lady. Normally she would say something shitty back to me, but she didn't even acknowledge what I said, which is definitely not normal for her, so I turned around to witness something horrifying. She stood up out of the bar stool, cupping Petey in her hands, and had him cuddled up to her neck. She was staring into space and looking at nothing in particular, but then her head dropped forward and her arms dropped to her sides all in one fluid motion and she obviously dropped Petey. I heard a little yelp from Petey and screamed at my mum who was still standing there with her head dropped forward and her arms dangling by her sides. What did you do? Why would you do that? She didn't respond to me, but she leaned down to pick Petey up and she cupped him in her hands and snuggled him up against her neck again. As soon as she was positioned, she did the exact same thing in the exact same way and I just stood there again with her head drooped forward and her arms dangling by her sides. I couldn't believe what I just saw and I couldn't move. 
I couldn't even form words at this point, so all I could do was scream. When I screamed, my mum looked up at me and let out this blood-curdling scream and dove face forward into the wall of the island counter. Then silence. I couldn't hear Petey. I couldn't hear my mum. I couldn't move. I don't know how long I stood there, but it felt like I was frozen in time, and everything I just witnessed seemed to happen in slow motion. Then I heard the bar stools scooting around, and my mum stood up. I was half expecting to see a bloody nose, but I didn't have time to look, because as soon as she stood up with her arms dangling by her sides, she fell forward like she was doing on a purpose, and did not raise her arms to stop her fall, and I heard her face make contact with the tile floor. I felt this sense of dread, and I don't know why I couldn't move to help her, because clearly there was something wrong. All I could do was scream. Every time I screamed, she would get up again and fall forward or backwards the second she was upright. It wasn't that she couldn't hold herself up. It was like she was intentionally free-falling to make sure her head and face would make direct contact with the tile. When she fell for the last time, it was in front of Tristan. He heard me screaming and came out of his room to see what was going on. The second he entered the kitchen, my mum spread her arms out wide to the side like Jesus on the cross. I'm sorry if that offends you, but that is exactly how she positioned herself. Her and her, my brother start, stared at each other for a few seconds and my mum fell back and smacked her hard on the tile so that it sounded like her skull cracked. My brother looked down at our mum and then back up at me. He turned around and walked his ass straight back to his room and shut the door. I know some of you may think it's fucked up, but he's different and I don't blame him for it. At this point, somehow, I'm standing over my mum. I don't remember leaving my spot in the kitchen, but I'm screaming at my mum to wake up. I'm scared to touch her because I don't know how hurt she is. She could have had a spinal cord injury from jumping headfirst into the island counter, maybe a broken nose or face. But now that I'm getting a good look at her, there's nothing. No blood, no bumps, only a little bit of redness. At this point, I stood up to call 911 because there's just no way she's not injured. But before I could get up to the, f to the phone, my mum got up and grabbed her keys and said, All right, you guys ready to go? Guys, I was stunned. Did I just imagine all that bullshit? There's no way I'm getting in the car with this woman because for all I know she'll drive us all off a cliff. Something inside me was telling me this episode wasn't over. I asked her to give me the keys and she got really mad at me and told me no. That little voice inside me was telling me to take charge so I demanded she give me the keys in the most authoritative voice I could muster up at that moment. She slammed her keys down on the kitchen island and I told her to sit down on the couch in the living room. I finally had my phone and I didn't know who to call. I was afraid to call the police, so I decided to call my aunt instead. Before I dialed the number, my mum asked for a puppy to hold. That's when I remembered Petey. I didn't see him around anywhere, so he wasn't injured enough to not be able to get away and hide. Naturally, I told her no, she could not hold a puppy right now. But that's when she completely changed. But I want to hold a puppy, please? That was not my mother. That was not her voice. It sounded like a toddler. Not like she was whining like a toddler. It's like she was a toddler. At this point, my heart was pounding. I dialed my aunt's number and the phone started ringing. When I turned to keep my eye on my mum, she was trying to sneak off the couch like a little kid trying to sneak out of time out. In the back of my mind, I thought if she was going to act like a child, I needed to act like, as an authority figure. So I snapped at her and said, get your ass back on that couch right now or I'm giving the puppies away. To my surprise, she listened and sat back on the couch and just cried. My aunt didn't answer, so I called my cousin. She wasn't picking up either, but I knew she didn't answer the phone when she was driving, so I kept calling over and over again so that maybe she would pick up on the fact that something was wrong. Up until this point, I haven't cried once, but as soon as my cousin answered the phone with a stalkers or us, why are you blowing up my phone, I burst into tears. I'm not a crier, so when I started crying, my cousin started panicking, and all I could say is something is wrong with my mum, and I need someone to come get me and Tristan. I didn't need to say more, so she got a hold of our aunt and I knew someone was on their way. I turned my attention back to my mum and she was totally fine. When I got off the phone, she looked really confused and said her head hurt and asked why I was crying. I couldn't even look at her and told her to stay away from me. I was screaming and crying and begging her not to get up and to stay on the couch. I remember just screaming at her and asking why she dropped Petey and she was acting so confused and scared that I was acting like that, so she started crying too. I was frantically looking for Petey and I found him hiding behind some parking boxes, just terrified. I picked him up and held him until my aunt got to our house. When my aunt got to our house, I begged her to take my mum to the hospital to get a CAT scan or something because I really thought she had to be hurt or at the very least she was having a mental breakdown or something. 
mum refused to go until we took Petey to the animal hospital to make sure he was okay first, but at the same time she was still really confused and so was my aunt. I couldn't really come to terms with what I'd witnessed and I was scared of my mum. I didn't tell my aunt what happened until we dropped mum off at the hospital. I begged to go to school because I didn't want to be at my house and I didn't want to see my mum, so she agreed to drop me off and pick me up at the end of the day. After school, my aunt picked me up and then my brother. We all went to get my mum from the hospital. All they told the hospital is that my mum fell a few times and hit her head, but they found absolutely no injuries. No bruising, no swelling, no fractures. There was nothing. My mum didn't remember anything at all other than hearing me scream. But when my aunt told my mum everything I told her, she got really weird and called someone to meet us at the house. When we got home, there was this guy I'd never met waiting for us. Apparently, he was a pastor who has experience with spiritual warfare. At the time, I was not religious. Sometimes I would say I was an atheist, and other times I would say I was agnostic. But I could tell you that I didn't know what to believe. I could only tell you what I saw. The pastor opened every door in the house and put oil over every open door. As soon as he started praying out loud, all of the dogs went crazy. They were barking and howling as quickly as it all started, it all stopped. We closed the front and back door to our shack. Bugsy waltzed right down the hall past the bathroom and for the very first time laid on the floor of my mum's bedroom. I refused to hear the explanation of everything because I was so shaken up. But apparently there was something looming in the bathroom in the hallway. My mum remembered before she put Petey down before getting out of my way so I could go to the bathroom. She remembered that Petey's face contorted and his tongue stuck out. She said the best way she could explain it was that Petey looked like his face had turned into a cartoon and stuck his tongue out at her. And because it happened so fast, she thought maybe she dropped him and he was having a seizure or something. Then she remembered panicking for a second and remembered nothing after that. For those of you concerned about Petey, he was perfectly fine as well. He was afraid of my mum for a day or so but went back to his playful self. My mum does not have a history of mental illness and nothing like that has ever happened since. We don't really talk about it to this day, other than my brother and I telling our sister. My mum and my brother still live in that house and as far as I know, nothing has happened since. Well, at least not inside the house. But that's a story for another time. That one gave me the goosebumps when I read it. Mm-hmm. Like the fucking visual mm-hmm. image of like the head lolling and like falling over and over again and like smacking a head into oh. the tiles. I fucking hate demon shit. <laughs> I sounded, I sounded sore, and anything that involves animals has always mm. got that extra level yeah. of like um, spookiness to it. You know what it reminded me of, though, at the end where they talk about like the puppy's tongue sticking out. Did you guys ever watch Jim Carrey's The Mask? <laughs> oh, long yeah. time ago. Right at the end, right at the end, his little Jack, uh, Jack Russell Terrier puts the mask on, and he turns into exactly that, like the big head oh, and yeah. like the snaky tongue and things like that. I could not get Jim Carrey's The Mask out of my head when I was <laughs> reading that. But that one gave me the goosebumps, so. Yeah, it was pretty good. So what's our verdict? Did it really happen? I mean, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm a pretty big believer in like the spiritual stuff and like, like demons and things like that. So it depends on what you believe in. For me, if there was some shit like infesting that house, then that's possible it could have happened. Um, but yeah, I think it's like, I guess, totally up to what you believe in. Guys, what do you think? It's one of those things where um, obviously people can uh, suffer from all kinds of uh, stuff in their head sometimes. Mm. So up until the point where the pastor got involved, um, I was like, you know what, this could be just like some serious mental health stuff, maybe. Mm. But like, uh, as soon as he mentioned the pasta thing, I was like, right, this is where this is going. Um, so, mm. you know, I'm not, uh, I've never had any of those sort of um, weird experiences, anything paranormal. Nothing, none of that has ever happened to me. So I uh, struggle to, uh, you know, deal with that stuff a lot of the time. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I never had any paranormal stuff happening to me, but I have had um, hallucinations um, relatively often. And what it sounded to me is like the mom might have been fine. Uh, what it sounded to me is like the narrator was hallucinating. And when they said at the, at the hospital that the mom that didn't have any injuries or, or whatever, it comforted me in that uh, belief. I think probably the, the, the person who is, if, if the person is, is not lying and making this up, probably the person who wrote this 
um, had a, some kind of hallucination or, or mental stuff. Um, that's what I think. Interesting. The way it was narrated, the way it was written, struck struck me as not normal, not some normal person who had a bad experience. Uh, it struck me as someone r- 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 um, like um, talking about like a, a nightmare that they had, or um, yeah, it sounded like the the person had had a, had a hallucination. That's how they feel like like okay. stuff happening again and again, especially and the timing, especially sort of. when the brother walked out. Because, you know, if, if there was something actually going on and the brother just walked out, that seems super like, what's going on there? Mm. Because cause I, cause I um, like, if that kind of shit happened um, and I just walked in, I would probably <laughs> try and do something. Yeah, if it was your mum, you'd was, be trying to... Even if, it, even, if it, even if it was someone I didn't like... If something like that happened, mm. I would feel the need to like intervene. Yeah, yeah. And the, but if the, I and the, if I yeah. walked out, going with that theory, if I'd walked out as the brother and just seen the mum being like, "What's going on?" and the kid just screaming and being like, "What are you doing? Why are you doing this?" I'd be like, "I'm not touching this," and walk out. That makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. But if I'd seen my mum, you know, smacking the head against tile and like being very injured, I wouldn't walk away from that. Like I'd be restraining her you know being like stop hurting mm. yourself you know yeah yeah or yeah. like um a lot of people say that you shouldn't restrain people if they're having like seizures or anything That's like true. that um it's a it's a difficult one but don't you have to because i know you're not supposed to touch people who are having seizures but i think also you're supposed to keep them safe right like make no, sure they're not yeah, able to yeah like, you should clear the area yeah, yeah you shouldn't restrain them but like you can break their fall by uh mm. like grab it on their arm and letting them because uh, if they mm. fall and they hurt their head i mean um basically uh, uh, i mean it's not a hundred percent um i'm going to oversimplify this but if you fall on your face it's basically impossible to get um very bad injuries i mean you might break your nose or your uh the stuff uh you know up your eye or like cut your lip but you're not gonna have brain damage or you know but if you fall on your back and the the back of your head hurt, uh, hits the floor you you could die like right on impact uh yeah that's and, true I, but you can yeah. have um orbifrontal cortex um injuries and those are really hard to diagnose because they just sort of shown by like a change in behavior like it's they're not so much disabled as much as like um, risk-taking behaviors, having hard, like trouble regulating emotions, things like that. Um, that like people with all be frontal cortex trauma. Um, so like you could damage a little bit, but you wouldn't be sort of like drooling in a wheelchair. But if it was a mental breakdown or a demon or a hallucination or any of them, what a terrifying thing to witness, even if it was in your own head, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's like fucked. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just like what we were talking about earlier, the um, sleep paralysis. It can be very, very frightening. Like, um, mm. it is a... Yeah. Mm. It takes a different form from person to person, but it is a form of hallucination. Yeah. It's like Sleep paralysis sucks. It's really mm. not nice. No. Horrifying. You have it too, as well? Steph was saying earlier that she has it. Yeah, I've gotten it quite a few times. Mm. I, it's uh, yeah. Mm. I never. It never happened to me, but it happened to a few friends of mine, and it, I'm quite um, anxious about it. I really hope it never happens to me. Although, like, I don't know. I've had many hallucinations in my life, and it still happens to me regularly. So, I kind of got used to it, and um, I don't know if it works like that for everyone. But like, when I when I'm having a hallucination, it takes me sometimes a few seconds to realize like oh sh- uh, like oh shit what the fuck is going on what the fuck is this? oh i'm hallucinating and as soon as i realize i'm hallucinating the hallucination goes away oh wow so i don't know if it's if it's like that's for everyone but like uh wow it's like what is when this when you're having oh, no, sleep paralysis you feel um it feels like you're awake so you think that what's happening to you you're really experiencing it and even like sometimes i don't even hallucinate mm. while i'm having sleep paralysis the scariest thing is that I can't move, like, no matter how hard I try, and and just yeah, yeah, I hate I, that my feeling. thing is like, if I can just manage to 
twitch the tips of my fingers like you're panicking you're like i can't move i can't move and i think to myself and you're sending yeah, like yeah, the yeah. strongest will like please 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 move and when you i don't know i mean the people i've spoken to have the same experience with me but when you break out of sleep paralysis it's it is like you've shattered a wall and you like sit up like you it's like you've broken out of something you come lurching yeah. forward like like gasping for air because and i don't know i can't speak for your experience but for me like like i get scared and and my lungs start to paralyze and i remember once i it felt like something mm. a lot of my like hallucinations are more of like a presence that i can feel but can't see and sometimes the presence will come and sit on my yeah. chest and crush it and my lungs will start to paralyze and i open my mouth to scream and then my throat closes up yeah. and like i'm like and in that moment i'm like i'm going to die here and it's like whoa it's horrifying <laughs> wow it feels like a presence to me so yeah the, the first mm. thing you notice is like you can't move um yeah and then and then ba basically every time that happens to me where i'm awake and i can't move i go okay i think i'm i'm having sleep paralysis and then i just try not to like look anywhere where my brain will like place some sort of shadowy thing that's coming out yeah. of the wall or window or because mm -hmm. that's what will start to happen. I'll start to think something's coming to get me while I'm paralyzed. And um, mm. uh, and so even if I close my eyes, though, it feels like uh, like something's in front of my face waiting for me to open yeah. them. So, like, I just I yeah. do freak out for a bit. And then once I start moving my arms, I uh, I go like, OK, it's it's like it's all good. You can move a whole like when you break, you can move a whole arm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like not not fully but like slowly and then like and then i start mm. to wake up uh yeah i sort of yeah mine's like i know that i can break if i can sort of like lurch forward but All do right. you know the feeling and it's really really hard to describe to people who haven't experienced sleep paralysis when you're familiar with it do you know it's coming you feel yeah the weight pull you into that special kind of sleep that kind of and you and sometimes sometimes I can break out of it there and other times the weight is too heavy and you know what's coming and you're like, Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. Like I just I don't want to, I don't want to, and then you're there and you can't move anymore. And yeah, that that like that's so hard to describe that weight, that feeling of being it is like being dragged down into it. Interesting, yeah. It sounds kinda of like experiencing a panic attack, but mm. but not. But mm, like kind of <laughs> as a quadriplegic right yeah um like uh, when uh, when in the in the past when i've had panic attacks sometimes it makes my arms seize up and i can't move them oh. so that's um i, I imagine i imagine it, it's it's kind of like that heavy that, but that's um, interesting but that was, this is one of my my deepest fears not not sleep paralysis but like it makes me say, it makes me think about one of my uh deepest strongest fears a locked in syndrome mm. What's... you know what you know what that is no, I've not heard of that. Like the Metallica song. It's, um, you are fully conscious, but you cannot say anything or move. People, sometimes people think you're in a coma. Sometimes people think you're like in a vegetative state or something like this. It's, uh, it's not very common, but it happens. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Like you're watching yourself or something. I mean, you can you can see and hear everything that's around you, and 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 you're trying to talk and you're trying to move, but you mm. can't. Um, yeah, there was a there was a quite good uh, episode in House about this. Uh, House didn't always get the medical facts straight, but this episode was pretty well made, according to doctors. I mean, I'm not a med medical professional; I'm just an asshole who dropped out of school at 16. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it is terrifying. It is terrifying, locked in syndrome. Like it's one of the things that I really hope will never happen to me. Because um, that, yeah, that would be. That sounds horrible. That yeah. would be terrible. I heard an account uh, from someone who had it for something like ten years. Um, not from them directly, but yeah, through reading something on the internet. They essentially just felt like they're in a dream state for most of it, and that it wasn't like a perception of time. It's not like every second is this like aching moment of, of like fear that that you're stuck or, like that eventually like the brain sort of, uh, reacts in this way of, like, no no perception of time, <clears throat> and just, just you're constantly just in your head. You probably just don't really care about what you're seeing and hearing that much because it never changes and. Um, yeah, 
um, really interesting perspective of um, somebody witnessing sleep paralysis from the outside. I really, really briefly dated this guy a few years ago and um, we were sleeping next to each other and I got sleep paralysis. And as I always before do when marriage. I finally get out of it, what was that? I said before marriage. Before marriage. <laughs> it was perfectly innocent. We were all staying at a friend's house. We were sleeping together on the floor. There was nothing sexy going okay. on. Sorry, but sorry. Uh, I'm sure they didn't hold hands. No, never. Um, but Sleep we paralysis were- before marriage. <laughs> 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 no, so I, I, I got straight to hell. And as I always do, I like lurched forward. And I finally came awake to him saying, like, step, step, step. Like, are you okay? Are you okay? Because I was like gasping for air. And I was like, I didn't, I, at that point, I actually didn't have a word for sleep paralysis yet. It was just ho- this horrifying thing I experienced. So I didn't really talk about it because I didn't think there was anyone who could understand. And um, anyway, I was like, yeah just like a bad dream and he said that i had been lying down like asleep with my eyes open just going (gasps) for like like gasping for air for about five minutes and i thought in my Mm. mind that i was like you know i trying to breathe but not being able to like laying like laying laying completely still still and and also unable to breathe so he saw me gasping but in my head I was just trying to get a lung full of oxygen and I couldn't. And that for me was really, really interesting to have somebody who'd witnessed me have sleep paralysis, didn't know what it was that was happening. Um, and yeah, just that, that they'd seen me just lying there gasping for air, like staring into space, absolutely terrified um, when mm. my perception of what was happening was so different. It is a lot like a panic attack. Sounds very eye-opening. Well, yeah, I mean, my... It, it, Everyone's is, panic attacks. It is a lot like a my panic. panic attacks are very different, but yeah. each to their own. Yeah. Right. So it happens to you when you're going to sleep. Sometimes I wake up with it, but often I can. If it ha- it happens yeah, when I'm going to sleep, it only happens sleep. when I wake up with it. I wake up with it sometimes, but sometimes I feel. Because do you know the feeling where you wake up with it, you break out of it, and it's a cycle. It drags you back down and you're in it again, unless you actually wake your brain up completely 100%. Mm, no. Because for me, it, thankfully. Oh, it's horrible. It's the cycle. That's so like I, it really sucks. Yeah, wow. oh, I wake up, I wake up and I'm gasping and I'm like, it's over, it's over. It was just sleep paralysis. Your face feels a bit numb or something. I have to smack myself up the face a bit, just like, oh. wake up, wake up, wake up. You're okay. Mm. So then I lie down. I'm like, I'm all right now. And I go back to sleep. And. I feel the weight start to take me again and it's not sleep it's Mm. it's if it was sleep you could roll over wake up it's different and you're like no not again not again not again and you're back in it and basically I'll keep breaking out of it and then being dragged back into it like a horrible horrible cycle unless I genuinely get up turn the light on like walk around have a drink of water I don't know like run on the spot for a bit like I have to be completely awake and let my brain completely restart the sleep cycle because otherwise I will have sleep paralysis over and over and over for the rest of the night Mm -hmm. like it's it it, once I'm in that space in my brain it doesn't want to let me go so anyway who's got another story (laughs) I I guess it's me next based off of um based off of what Nelson said at the beginning um that's okay with you yeah 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 that's more than fine with me uh, right, so the the story I'm going to be reading today is simply called uh, Footsteps, and um, I found this on Reddit. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, so this, is, this one's a little bit lo- uh, of a long one as well, uh, so hold on tight. Um, in fact, it, the story starts that way. Uh, this is long, so I apologise for that. I've never had to tell this story with enough detail to actually explain it all the way, but it is true, and it happened when I was about six years old. In a quiet room, if you press your ear against a pillow, you can hear your heartbeat. As a kid, the muffled rhythmic beats sounded like soft footsteps on a carpeted floor, and so as a kid, almost every night, just as I was about to drift off to sleep, I would hear these footsteps, and I would be ripped back to consciousness, terrified. 
For my entire childhood, I lived with my mother in a fairly nice neighbourhood that was in a transitional phase. People of lower economic means were gradually moving in, and my mother and I were two of these people. We lived in the kind of house that you see being transported in two pieces on the interstate, but my mum took good care of it. There were a lot of woods surrounding the neighbourhood that I would play in and explore during the day, but at night, as things often do to a kid, they took on a more sinister feeling. This coupled with the fact that due to the nature of our house, there was a fairly large crawl space underneath filled my mind with imaginary monsters and inescapable scenarios which would consume my thoughts when I was awoken by the footsteps. I told my mum about the footsteps and she said that I was just imagining things. I persisted, enough that she blasted my ears with water from a turkey baster once just to placate me, since I thought that would help. Of course it didn't. Despite all the creepiness and footsteps, the only thing that ever happened was that every now and then I would wake up on the bottom bunk despite having gone to sleep on the top, but this wasn't really weird since I'd sometimes get up to piss or get something to drink and could remember just going back to sleep on the bottom bunk. I'm an only child, so it doesn't matter. This would happen once or twice a week, but waking up on the bottom bunk wasn't too terrifying, but one night I didn't wake up on the bottom bunk. I heard the footsteps, but was too far gone to be woken up by them, and when I was awoken, it wasn't from the sound of footsteps or a nightmare, but because I was cold, really cold. When I opened my eyes, I saw stars. I was in the woods. I sat up immediately and tried to figure out what was going on. I thought I was dreaming, but that didn't seem right, though neither did me being in the woods. There was a deflated pool float right in front of me, one of those ones shaped like a shark. This only added to the surreal feeling, but after a while it seemed like I just wasn't going to wake up because I wasn't asleep. I stood up to orient myself, but I didn't recognise these woods. I played in the woods by my house all the time, and so I knew them really well, but if these weren't the same woods, then how could I get out? I took a step and felt a shooting pain in my foot which knocked me back to where I'd just been laying. I had stepped on a thorn. By the light of the moon I could see that they were everywhere. I looked at my other foot, but it was fine. As a matter of fact, so was the rest of me. I didn't have another scratch on me, and I wasn't even that dirty. I cried for a little bit, then stood back up. I don't know which way to go, so I just picked a direction. I resisted the the urge to call out, since I wasn't sure that I wanted to be found by who or what might be out there. I walked for what seemed like hours. I tried to walk in a straight line and tried to course correct when I had to take details, but I was a kid and I was afraid. There weren't any howls or screams, and only once did I hear any noise that scared me. It sounded like a crying baby. I think now that it was just a cat, but I panicked. I ran veering in different directions to avoid big bushes and collapsed trees, and I was paying close attention to where I stepped because by that point my feet were in pretty bad shape. I paid too much attention to where I was stepping and not enough to where those steps were leading because not long after hearing the cry I saw something that filled me with a kind of despair that I haven't experienced since it was the pool float. I was only 10 feet from where I had woken up. This wasn't magic or some supernatural space bending. I was lost. Up until that moment, I thought more about getting out of the woods than how I got in, but being back in the beginning caused my mind to swim. I wasn't even sure that these were my woods. I had only been hoping that they were. Had I run in a huge circle around that spot, or did I just get turned around and start making my way back? How was I going to get out? At the time, I thought the North Star was just the brightest star, and so I looked and found the brightest one and followed it. Eventually, things started to look more familiar, and when I saw the ditch, a dirt ditch that my friends and I uh, would have dirt clod wars in, I knew I had made it out. By that point, I was walking really slowly because my feet hurt so much, but I was happy to be close to home that I broke into a light jog. When I actually saw the roof of my house over a neighbouring lower set house, I let out a light sob and ran faster. I just wanted to be home. I had already decided that I wouldn't say anything because I had no idea what I could possibly say. I would get back in the house somehow, clean up and get in my bed. My heart sunk as I rounded the corner and my house came fully into view. Every light in the house was on. 
I knew my mum was up, and I knew I would have to explain, or try to explain, where I had been, and I couldn't even figure out where to start. My run became a jog, which became a walk. I saw her silhouette through the blinds, and although I was worried about how to explain things to her, that didn't matter to me at that point. I walked up the couple of steps to the porch and put my hand on the doorknob and turned. Right before I pushed it open, two arms wrapped around me and pulled me back. I screamed as loud as I could, Mum, help me, please, Mum. The feeling of being so close to being safe and then being physically pulled away from it filled me with a kind of dread that is, even after all these years, indescribable. The door I had been torn away from opened, and a flash of hope shot through my heart, but it wasn't my mum. It was a man, and he was enormous. I thrashed around and kicked at the shins of the person holding me while also trying to get away from the person who had just come out of my house. I was scared, but I was furious. Let me go! Where is she? Where's my mum? What did you do to her? As my throat stung from screaming, I was drawn uh, and I was drawing in another breath. I became aware of a sound that had been present for longer than I'd perceived it. Honey, please calm down. I've got you. It sounded like my mum. The arms loosened and set me down, and as man approaching me blocked out the porch light with his head, I noticed his clothes. He was a cop. I turned to face the voice behind me and saw that it really was my mum. Everything was okay. I began to cry, and the three of us went inside. I'm so glad you're home, sweetie. I was worried I'd never see you again. By that point, she was crying too. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I just wanted to come home. I'm sorry. It's okay, just don't ever do that again. I'm not sure if, my, if me or my shins could take it. A little laughter broke through my sobs and I smiled a bit. Well, I'm sorry for kicking you, but why did you have to grab me like that? I was just afraid that you'd run away again. I was confused. What did you mean? We found this note on your pillow, she said, and pointed at the piece of paper that the police officer was sliding across the table. I picked up the note and read it. It was a running away letter. It said that I was unhappy, never wanted to see her or any of my friends again. The police officer exchanged a few words with my mum on the porch whilst I stared at the letter. I didn't remember writing a letter, I didn't remember anything about any of this, but even I sometimes went to the bathroom at night and didn't remember or even if I could have gone into the woods on my own. Even if all of that could have been true, the only thing I knew at this point was, this isn't how you spell my name and I didn't write this letter. Ooh. I think the only logical explanation is that the Fae tried to steal him and was going to replace <laughs> him with a changeling child, but they didn't get around to that part. <laughs> so, Ooh. fucking tricky tricksters. Never give the Fae your name. Never accept the gi gifts from a Fae. You just, you can't trust them. That that must have been what the, um, the pool float was, a gift from the Fae. A and if he'd taken it, if he'd <laughs> taken it, he would have found himself either A betrothed to the fairy queen or B hunted for sport or like enslaved forever in the wild hunt but but he but he could have had a shark pool float win-win situation <laughs> wait so this is another allegedly true story <laughs> yeah yeah mm. They'd allegedly have to be, true think, to add mm. to the uh, the spooky element i think they all yeah. are to yeah mm. for spooky it, 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 it sounds like a an extreme to me it sounds like like a super extreme case of sleepwalking yeah with like combined with like a nightmare i think it sounds like and a ex it, super extreme case of the fae being tricksters <laughs> Bloody bastards! Because of the because of the the shark thing, it reminded me of that movie Ghost Shark. Have you seen it? It's fucking crazy. I, it's, it's, I think <clears throat> I've uh, seen like screen caps uh, screen caps of it, and it looked really it's tacky. It's just like there's like basically the the plot of the movie is like there's this ghost shark, and he can appear wherever there is water. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning it starts appearing like in lakes and rivers and like then it was and I don't know maybe it gets better at it so at some point you see it like appear in some some someone's swimming pool and like and then it gets completely fucked up and like it's like just the rain and the, the ghost shark is like appears from the rain and then at and then at some point the the, the it keeps like it keeps that sounds the, like some the movie keeps getting shit. the movie keeps getting worse and worse <laughs> and at some point people are like oh shit but we are 70 percent water and then so <laughs> the shark starts burst, bursting out of people and it's like fuck man that that must that must have been one genius oh shark. my god <laughs> 
Okay, here's a theory. The ghost shark was in his toilet, and he also was sleepwalking. <laughs> so he'd get up, the ghost shark... The ghost uh, shark possessed him. It was actually a plastic sh- ghost shark. Uh, adducts <laughs> it to the woods. In his, in his sleep, he's battling the plastic ghost shark, and then when he is able to bust the plastic ghost shark, he wakes up and then has to just get himself out of the That's woods. why he was surrounded by thorns, yeah. because he used the thorns to defeat the, yes. the, the, the pool float or, ghost yes, shark. because he was in the land of fairy. <laughs> you're, you're dead set on this fairy yeah, thing, aren't you? I mean, ghost so. fairies, like, what's the difference, really? <laughs> ghost Ghost fairies. Oh, that's, an, that's ghost, another ghost level entirely. Ghost fay. Ghost fay. Ghost fay. Let me tell you, random patches of wood that you end up going in circles in that have, like, thorns everywhere, like, mysteriously. I'm sorry. Like, they're not being slick. Like... Classic. It's like the Lost Woods. It's like the Lost oh Woods from Zelda. You just go in one direction, it takes Blair you back to Witch. the beginning. It's, and there, there are fairies. It's literally Blair Witch. Tell you what, though, did you guys see the recent remake of Pet Cemetery? No. I have not seen the original. Uh, a bit of the original book, though. I've not seen the original either, no. It was fucking terrifying. It was terrifying. And and there was this horrible part where I left the cinemas because I had to go to the bathroom and I could hear like the suspenseful music coming from in the cinema and I was already like so wound up because the movie had been so scary and it's a quiet like I'm so embarrassing to be around it's like a quiet foyer of a cinema and I'm walking up the steps I'm about to open the door and I hear like this noise behind me and I whip around and there's this like man behind me who was also in the same cinema and just gone to the bathroom and I let genuinely let out like a small scream and like fell down <laughs> and he was like and he's like I'm so sorry I'm like I just really wound up man like this film is really <laughs> fucking scary <laughs> it was like I should have like coughed or something but I just heard like mm. the softest footstep and I hadn't seen him he was just right behind me I was like get fucked I remember um using a DVD an online DVD rental service back in the day uh, to <laughs> to watch uh, the birds. I say back in the day. Mm. That's one of those weird n- <laughs> ten niche years ago things that was around when n- when people uh, actually used Netflix. To I, I, I think it was. I think it was about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. I think it was about 13 years ago uh, when this happened, <gasps> and my brother and I had ordered it from like Love Film. I think it might have been. Mm, that and, sounds um, like a porn site. Yep. Yeah, it does. Love. Was film. it a porn Ooh. film? Um, Did you rent a porn film? No, it was. It, it was Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> Hitchcock. It was um, Hitchcock. <laughs> bird. Um, oh yeah, Hitch. Which oh, Hitch. Your Early bird gets the worm. I I remember seeing. I think there may have been some seagulls in that movie. Mm, sexy. Definitely. And. Um, I, at the time, I was living in the northeast of Scotland, and anyone who's been in the city of Aberdeen will know that the uh, the apex predator there are the seagulls. Um, they will swarm you in gangs and try to attack you for your food. Um, and oh, they are like ma- ma- magpies. Well, they're bigger than the other seagulls in the rest of the UK as well. So they're like um, these ones are like Hulk seagulls, and um, <laughs> I had one land on my shoulder and snatch like a. Um, a uh, fajita out of my hand once, oh, and uh, a- then <laughs> and and then uh, whack me in the yep. face with its wing as it flew off. Damn. And um, I had a, a friend buy like a cheese and onion roll from a Greg's, um, mm. and he stepped outside, and like seven or eight seagulls immediately appeared and started swooping him. So he was like, "I'm not going to fight for this," and he just Threw. yeeted that that cheese and onion <laughs> roll across the street, and uh, all these birds just started like pecking at it and fighting each mm. other and um i think uh alfred hitchcock's the birds hits differently once you've experienced um aberdeen seagulls well it's oh, mag- yeah, it's, yeah. Mag- yeah. it's magpie swooping season yeah here. uh i have a magpies are tiny i have a magpie here. story at least um uh, <coughs> i went for a ride is it a creepy pasta i'll try and make magpies it creepy are a creepy pasta um okay uh, so, i live so, so. i live sort of out out in the sticks a bit and um i went for i decided to go for a ride to this town that's a little bit out of the way um i'd have no reason to go in that direction or to that town really i just wanted to go for a ride um and it just it has this like this really backwoodsy sort of feel to it like you'd start to 
to come across like the deliverance sort of type people i don't know if you heard of that movie ding, 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 yeah. Ding, ding, yeah, ding, yeah. Ding. but like the, i get the reference the australian version of that <laughs> <laughs> um and like the 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 layout of the roads didn't really make much sense um like on my phone it said there were shops like it said that there was a like a petrol station um that and usually uh, petrol stations have like lots of food and and stuff i just figured i'd be able to go into one of those but it was like a truck petrol station so like it just it was just the pumps and uh, oh. so but and as i was riding looking for at least like a general store um I like I heard this sort of noise like this yeah just sort of a whoosh noise and then suddenly uh it felt like someone had just punched my my helmet um quite hard uh and like I sort of lost my balance for a second while riding and then quickly like corrected and I realized like I, I heard it whoosh away again so I thought okay that's a magpie I just got like hit by a magpie um they like they swoop at you d- to defend their nest uh, and I thought, okay, he's had his fun, and I just kept riding, and then suddenly this 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 second bang onto my head, um, just really Did started throwing the, me off. Did you have the zip ties? I, the zip ties stick it out through your helmet? No, no, no. no. I, oh. I guess I'm too new to riding. I just didn't think I'd need it. And uh, you, you hadn't crafted the anti magpie helmet yeah. plus one. This yet. is common enough that Australians have strategies like for. Yep. And, uh, oh and yeah, we just googly... can't, I'm not kidding. We have zip ties sticking through our helmet mm. so that okay. when the magpies swoop us, they like can't hit us. This oh. is like googly eyes as well. I'll post a photo. I'll post a photo. If I ever visit Australia, I'll have to get one of those primer strategy guides for living <laughs> in Australia. Because everything in Australia is trying to kill you. I should write a pr- prima guide. Including these two right here. <laughs> Australians and rats have a lot in common because uh, rats in the wild, rats in the wild, the primary predator. Uh, I mean, they're not really a prey species. They rarely get preyed on because they're so stealthy, you know. So they mm. live inside burrows. So, um, but yeah, th- their main threat is birds. And I'm so- sounding more and more like a rat. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and uh, the Australians' biggest enemy is the birds, and we all remember the MU war <laughs> and uh, all these magpies' uh, helmets. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, bloody emus. Okay, it's sent so you guys could all have a look. Um, I have a magpie swooping story. I was in, um, uh, we were going on a road trip, a six hour road trip to go see my extended family in Bundaberg. And with three hours in, we usually stop at this same park for just lunch, just Subway or something. And I was younger, so I went into the playground and it had like, like the high playground fence so that kids couldn't run off. So, I, like the pool fences. So I was in and I was like just sitting on a swing, like acting all melancholy and just like twirling myself around on the swing. And this magpie lands in front of me. And I'm not kidding. It was the most fucking angry magpie I've ever seen. I mm. shit you not, its eyes were red. It like <laughs> looked at me. like Yeah, they, they look angry. And it, like, they just squawked. And I was like, I'm fuck Like it, it just landed at my feet and I'd twisted myself up in this swing. So I couldn't just jump off. And it was like, and just like squawked at me and I was like, oh fuck. So I've untwisted myself and I've started to run away and I couldn't just like run out of the zone because there was this pool fence and it was, I was just out running it enough that if I stopped for a second to unlatch this pool fence, it'd get me and start pecking my head in. So I'm just screaming at the top of my lungs and running in circles around this playground. And this fucking magpie did not fight clean. It kept landing on pieces of equipment and like taking shortcuts. So I'm doing a clean circle running away from Mm. this fucking thing. Mm. And it kept like swooping in front of me and above me and like hit my head with its wings once or twice. It was horrible yeah. and it was like such an angry magpie i'm like i'm not coming near your nest i just want to sit on this swing got, for a bit like i i got chased out of town by them absolutely that's insane. the end of how that whole ride went i they just wouldn't stop <laughs> i went to the center of town i even found the general store and stuff and they were just waiting for me to just to leave so i, I man I try to stay close to trees and it's like the, it's like when the bees are outside the swimming pool in cartoons I shot a magpie once. You what? Uh, uh, Damn right. I I shot a magpie once with a rifle, so you're welcome. Is that legal? Legal? 
I mean, they're not they're not an endangered species, as far as I know. Are so. y'all in Australia? Are you not allowed to practice lethal self defense against magpies? No, we 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 kill stuff. Okay, <laughs> lethal, lethal self defense. We're not even allowed to shoot I, um, snakes, technically, even when they're big bloody eastern browns. I I just googled Australian magpies out of curiosity because yeah. something in my heart made me feel like. My magpie and your magpie are yeah, two different things, and um, put a UK magpie up there as well. I um and yes, um the the magpies we get in the UK look a lot more chill and a lot more like colourful. Um, look how where, angry they look. W- whereas <laughs> the Australian so Australian cute. magpies look like the the bastardization of Raptors. a cr- of a crow and a skunk. Um, <laughs> that's. <laughs> They're very angry. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, it's like the difference between uh, European badgers and American badgers. <laughs> European badgers be like, oh, have you got the time for a spot of tea, old chap? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> exactly. Are there literally badgers and like the whole frog and toad shit? Or, <laughs> Wind in the willows. <laughs> Wind in the willows, yeah. There's badgers in that shit, right? Like cutesy badgers. Or like Australian possums and American possums. Oh, yeah. I see photos of American possums and those things oh, just look feral. Australian, Australian possums, possums are, so, are so, cute. so cute. We had this guy's place I used the to hang out with. We were, we were mates. They used to all sit out on the porch and there was this possum who used to just hang out and he was affectionately nicknamed Thick Sack Jack <laughs> because they named him Jack and he had a thick sack. <laughs> and he just used to hang around everyone while they'd sit around and drink. That was Thick Sack Jack. He was your mate. He just hung up on the on the electricity wires and just look down at you. They're lovely. They're so cute. So I, I can just imagine seeing like the Australian and uh, European magpie next to each other. And it's like, who are you? I'm you, but Australian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm you, but better. <laughs> or it's like the difference between uh, I, uh, I yeah, put a picture between of the sea otters and river them. otters, which are like it's. You get sea otters. Sea otters are. Sea otters are massive. Oh, yeah, but they are very cute and, and nice. And the river mm. otters, like freshwater otters, are terrifying. <laughs> uh, what? Did you ever? S- They're so cute. I've seen photos. <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up. Okay, post a photo. Yeah. I also, think those, both cute. those European <laughs> magpies look like look like hummingbirds they look so cute yeah they're cuties oh, they're not as they're not as small um they're not as small as hummingbirds i would say they're about the size of like a pigeon or a blackbird um but uh they are uh, they are pleasant we have like a rhyme about counting them here and everything i can't remember what the rhyme is but we have like a rhyme about counting four, magpies that's how endearing they are over black here birds. four and twenty blackbirds a- baked in a pie is it that one? Yeah. When the pie was open? No. Um, um, it's... No, no. I, I can't remember. It's it's one of these, like, children's rhymes to do with, like, if you count this many, you'll have good fortune. And oh, if yeah. you have this many, you'll get married or whatever. It's, oh, um, I've heard that. It's, like, certain amount of birds in a flock or something. Yeah, yeah. but in, in here it's particularly about magpies. Mm. And um, yeah, you can tell there are a lot more, you know... Uh, loved here. <laughs> uh, so, actually, so yeah, actually, I was uh, I was kind of wrong. It's a specific kind of river otter called a giant otter. That is uh, oh. quite. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop in the chat in the same uh, stuff. Right. That's a sea otter that I'm that I posted right now in the upcoming episodes channel, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. a giant river otter. Oh! Whoa! Oh my! That's a feisty boy. That's a cool image. That's like Godzilla right there. Feisty. One of the pictures in uh, that has just been shared. I'll I'll be putting these on the aneurysm Instagram. Thank um, God! Yeah. If you are one, listening one and don't these... want to wait for that, like, please Google because that thing looks like a dinosaur. That's horrifying. Uh, but I. Uh, uh, I've, I think I've seen a picture of one of those giant otters like eating a melon and looking sad before. Yeah. Um, like there's a meme of it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen um, that. And it, it just looks so pissed off at this melon. But yeah, look, looking at the picture again of those magpies side by side, it looks like one of those uh, uh, science diagrams that look like shit posts because it's like not COVID. Yes, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in, I'm in yeah. that group on Facebook. <laughs> it's a it's a pretty good one. Um, 
COVID-19. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> I think I've literally never seen a magpie at all. Is that sad? No. That's a, oh, lucky. Do you have them? That, that, that sounds like an American problem. Yeah. For a ride. Yes. Just a casual ride into the <laughs> countryside. An American problem or an American blessing? <laughs> um... <laughs> It depends on on your magpie. Um, <laughs> Same thing. I think that most, the most threatening bird I've ever encountered was a goose. Oh, I wouldn't want to fucking yeah. go near. Yeah, the yeah. goose can be dead. Razor sharp teeth. Yeah. They, you they, honk. They, they it is a beautiful day I in was hell. terrified of them when I was a kid. Because, like, I lived uh, in the countryside, uh, in, like, in the middle of, like, between farms and stuff like this. And uh, in the southwest of France, birds are a big thing. Like, that's where foie gras comes from and uh, a lot of stuff like this. Of course. Um, and so lots of geese, lots of ducks, lots of all that shit. And I was terrified of them. Like, um, I was afraid of most animals. I was afraid of pigs. I was afraid of cows. Um not sheep. Cows are pretty scary. I think cows are pretty scary. Even sheep can be can be scary because when you're a kid and it's like because they they you know they're in um, how do you say um, flocks? Well, what? they have devil eyes. That's part of it. Like a flock when there's loads of them. Correct. Yes, that's why I was uh, trying to say a, a, um, a, f- a flock. Yeah, a herd. Flock. Flock a sheep. The 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 word uh, uh, the word I was looking for is. Sheep. Herd. Oh, is it a herd? Yeah. yeah, a herd of sheep, not a flock. A flock is birds. Yeah. What am I on about? <laughs> flock a flock of sheep. Uh, but, a flock but, of sheep just flying along. But yeah, it's, it's, and sometimes like they. Now that's terrifying. <laughs> sheep and, birds. And sometimes they, they cross the road like this, and like there's like hundreds of them. It's like it's like a fucking <laughs> stampede, like in The Lion King. I I, I had seen I, the first movie that I saw in a cinema when I was a kid was The Lion King, and so they, there was this stampede that uh, I was terrified of and sheep. The original Lion King, you saw that in cinemas. Yep. Yeah, the first we're, movie. We're both yes, of so. that age. We both yeah. saw it in the theater. I can't fathom being that old, so that's amazing. Congratulations. The earliest film I saw in the cinema was A Bug's Life. <laughs> Damn. I was like past my prime. I was like almost too old to go to kids' movies at that point. Hey, it's Giles' turn to tell a story. Yes. Yep. It's called Abandoned by Disney. Ooh. Let her rip. Sup. Normally there should be an ad here. If there isn't and you're seeing this instead, it must mean you're checking our episode out on a platform where we're not monetized yet, like YouTube or Facebook, most likely. If you love our show, if you like what we're doing, want to support us, please listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Podcast Addict. We're on every audio streaming app for uh, audio in general or podcasts and if you're checking us out on one of these platforms not only we get money but also it boosts our numbers so we'll get a better chance of being recommended to people if you want to support our show please listen instead on spotify or breaker or the google podcast i mean any of these apps really if you don't listen to podcasts on your phone for some reason and you don't have a Spotify subscription you can check us on our site at Anchor uh, where you can listen on your mobile or your PC Uh, the I'm gonna put the link of the Instagram and our website on the screen thanks for listening and yeah back to the show in three two one Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real, live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew $30 million on the place. Yes, $30 million. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate, and there was even blame cast on the workers, saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of their story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy. 
Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate, but why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mowgli, then you might better remember the story The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere, you'd know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened and pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was the concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney Co. actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear, well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle and loincloths, not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damned thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irate tourists. Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down and no one knew what the hell to think but they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks that, who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give the place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit he found there. Stuff just left behind. Things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's Palace. Plus there were rumours that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace, take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there, because honestly it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the Palace Resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of the place that had been scrubbed clean. Even odder, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about this place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, 
though that was to be expected since they had all swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lauding their embarrassment, you know. Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather that their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old as hell map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I had guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I'd only remembered it months into my research, and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it all into, but I did find it. Locals were no help as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years, or old residents who, who just sneered at me and gave rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I find Mowgli's? The drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and had tr tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap with hand-painted letters scrawled in black, abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not drive. So grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm tree stood untended and ragged amongst piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking bug-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken. Rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentified material, what was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar, was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building, frozen in a jovial wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swathes of his fur and vines ensnared his platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint hadn't peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping moor where they had been, someone had once again painted, abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums, but no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the moulding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-a-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space, no expenses spared, every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist and then carefully letting go. But within seconds, it started to swing once more. 
The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like the Treasure Island Resort, someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about a half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay in there very long. What's odd is that these toilets and the sinks, and the bidets in the ladies' room, yes, I went there, all dripped, leaked, or ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut the water off long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have the time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. I thought it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind. This is what it sounded like. Number one, I didn't believe it. Number two, short unknown reply. Number one, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Number two, your father told you. Number one, unknown reply or possibly just weeping. I know, I know that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced. Why I thought there might have been something running in that room or worse, some vagrants who had holed up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and had wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all my troubles, even if it was just a photograph. There as a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell onto the object in a perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked directly into my eyes, turned and slithered off the pedestal across the grass into the trees all 80 feet of it. Its long head disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the sunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I read about the sharks at Treasure Isle and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times, backed away from where the snake had been, back towards the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slaps of my own face to get myself right in the head again after that. I looked for a place to sit down as my legs were feeling a bit like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down, unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or haul myself back up onto a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace lobby and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for a startling accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall once again painted with abandoned by Disney motto I'd become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign, read, mascots only, thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would definitely have some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wantonly steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall. 
something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascot's only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens. There were clocks, even a punch-in clock on the wall complete with filled-out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even a small break room with an old static-filled television and long rotted out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalyptic movies where everything is left in the state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascots only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, papers scattered and almost melded with the damp floor, and a large carpet of mould was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything wood disintegrated into mus mush when I applied even the least amount of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dank, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words Character Prep 1 stenciled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound and the door creaked open slowly. Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to just keep getting brighter until the bulbs exploded, but just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly how I pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers towards the back. What I found odd, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse costume at the centre of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the centre of the floor like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even odder, however, was the colouring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should have been white, and white where he should have been black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls, upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen, putrid cartoon faces with some plastic eyes missing, and then I decided to stage a shot just one of the bedraggled characters' heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud, clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet, and there between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know. I had to, for any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I'd need proof of what happened. 
especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind, right from the start, that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, the photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet, the Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, over and over and over. With shaking hands and a violently thrashing heart and legs that had once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera up and aim it at the opposite creature, now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera's screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixels spread, marring the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went black and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. Hey, it said in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Want to see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood. So much thick, chunky yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh, only cared about getting away. Above the doorway, out of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails, abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of my camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, I fled for my sanity, if not for my very life. I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in, and they didn't want anything like that getting out. Get fucked! <laughs> That was awesome. Oh man, that took a turn. That was so fucking that creepy. Was so that was a pleasant kind of tenseness. I I enjoyed that one a lot. It was worth it. It was worth all the build up. Wherever the big yeah. house of yeah. mouse get involved, yeah. things always get a bit, you know, a bit spooky. Creepy. Where it says that was fucking. Where creepy. it says like that the costume says, "Hey, want to see my head come off?" But in a perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Hey, want to see my head come off? Yeah, hey, yeah. Wanna yeah. see my head cut off? Oh, yeah. Hello, folks. Oh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought about it, but I'm like, no, I'll destroy it if I do this like <laughs> crappy Mickey Mouse impression. Wait, wait, wait. Do your do your sloth impression again. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I can't remember what that noise was, but yeah, that's yeah. Uh, the sloth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> That. Yeah. My God, when like the human skull came out, I was like, <laughs> "Get fucked!" <laughs> some like so, I I was getting that uh, that friction, you know, where you're like your spine feels tingly. I was getting that mm-hmm. um, when he mentioned that the the claws were swinging in the in the freezer, and that like mm. he stopped it, and then it started swinging again. For some reason, that was enough for me to yeah. just go like, "Ooh, that's uncomfortable." Mm-hmm. I, like, mm. hate, like, poisonous animals and things like that. And, like, the realisation that he was, like, standing where the reptile pit had been mm. and they mm. just released them everywhere. I was like, I, I would have <laughs> left then. Like, I'd have been like, are you joking me? I'm going to get, like, face go face to face with some random snake mm. that's going to come out of the shrubbery. Mm. Like, I, like, I don't think so. Like, that's what you, I'd have you learned. Can, you like, can only hope oh, that it no. would be suffering from reptile dysfunction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But if you hate venomous animals, what the fuck are you doing in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was born. Yeah. Don't have the money to go elsewhere. Excuses, excuses. You can unborn yourself in Australia. <laughs> Whoa. Fuck. How do you do that? <laughs> It's just a provocative thing to say. Did did you mean it as like suicide or like crawling back inside your mom's? You live 
live it's you live in America. I don't think you can't tell me when unborn myself. You're like you can unborn yourself from Australia. You live in the USA. Where is your high horse? <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, okay. telling you that oh you boy. live in the United States of America is just enough of an insult. Like, <laughs> the, the USA. You so hey, you know what? Oh. It's like, you, your life is so sad, it's like you live in the United States of America. <laughs> Eat that. Oh, uh, what's that? Yeah, I've got like fucked. I've got like yeah. one <laughs> I've got one really weird little cough or like a really minor little problem. You know what, just to be safe, I'm just gonna run to the doctors and it's not gonna cost me a thing. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Go in there. Oh, Frontier no. medicine out here. Oh oh we we can do that here in the UK, but we'll be waiting a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Share that. Yeah. I had to schedule my own MRI and pay for that. Oh, I didn't pay for my MRI. I mean, I you have to schedule it. Like, I was like, hi, I'm due for an MRI, and I scheduled it, but, like, I didn't pay for it. I actually... if if I guess if it's... It might have been part of a diagnosis, so they, like... But whereas mine was just, like, self You just wanted a random I MRI? <laughs> uh, I, I was getting Scan really me, bad please. migraines. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I really, I really wanted right on. one. <laughs> They didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. See, this like, this kind of brings me on to something that's kind of related to both the the story and hospitals. Nice. About four or five years ago, um, I explored an abandoned hospital with some friends. Oh man, um, that's so uh, haunted, so deeply <laughs> haunted. I um, it, it had to have been about one or two in the morning, I think. And um, why? <laughs> Because, because, um, it was in a, it's in a Are town called... Are you crazy? Called, uh, boys will be boys. It was in a village called uh, Bankery, which is, um, not too far away from Aberdeen in Scotland. And, um, this, it was a, it was a condemned abandoned hospital. So it, uh, it's now been destroyed. It isn't there anymore, which is sad because I would have loved to have gone there again someday. But like, um, the, the, I have some photos somewhere. If I can find them, I'll share them with you sometime. Um, but there were like books and pages all like scattered across the hallways, and like um, where it had been so damp, they had most of them had like stuck to the floor. Um, there were stairways which were so rotten and fucked up that like you could try and climb up them and I could feel them almost giving way under my feet and I was probably the heaviest Man, that's enough I was probably the heaviest of my friend group there so I'm like you guys feel free to go up there but I'm I'm staying down here and I stayed on a floor of a hospital by myself whilst my friends went and like explored we each had like a massive industrial torch that we'd brought with us it was one of the coolest moments ever. Getting into the hospital was probably the scariest moment because I'm not particularly good at climbing. And we had to get in through like a broken window because a lot of the front bits had like been barred up and um, there were a lot of these planks like across the doors and everything where it had been nailed into place. It was really, really cool. Um, I would love to do something like that again. I've only ever been to one abandoned building since in Dundee. Not not uh, I, I, Dundee. yeah, not Australia Dundee, uh, which I'm sure there's probably <laughs> one of, uh, but Scotland Dundee. Crocodile Dundee. And um, this is a noise. That was it was a an abandoned <laughs> printing facility. That's not a knife. <laughs> um, but most of the walls of this printing facility had been torn down, so you could like climb up into it and um, you could be several floors up and there would be no walls. Um, it was, uh, that was pretty, pretty awesome as well. Kind of freaky uh, being that high up without any like walls there or anything. I'm going to um, say something. Mm. I think you deserve to be killed first in a horror film with those with that kind of behavior honestly <laughs> honestly like how did this happen all i did was break into an abandoned definitely haunted <laughs> hospital at two in the morning <laughs> oh man well lisa it's your turn i believe okay um well, i'll give you guys a choice do you want me to do you want to hear me play hotel california on my kazoo or read the <laughs> guy fieri creepypasta oh guy fieri creepypasta <laughs> guy yeah fieri. okay yeah, All right, go cool. Take us to Flavor Town. Do any of you listen to last podcast on the left? Nope. No, but it's on my to listen to list. Okay, cool. Then I won't. Do you listen to? Yeah, list. I won't be uh, 
you won't have heard this already, maybe. Okay, so I heard this one because I had a boss who was really obsessed with last co- podcast on left, but it's from it's from Reddit. So it's called uh, My Curse, My Flavor Town 2, Flavor Bound. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sat on the floor of my kitchen in a circle of candles. Wreathed in the shifting, flickering light, I was working on opening the device. It was triangular in shape and made of wood or metal. It was tough to say. The puzzle had what appeared to be representations of pepperoni and cheese on it. Somehow, I had to reconfigure this into a pizza slice if I wanted to open the portal to Flavortown. Hours passed. I was making progress, twisting a pepperoni here and realigning some cheese there. I moved my fingers along the crust, and almost imperceptibly, I felt a click. I knew I was almost there. (laughs) I spun the crust around, and suddenly, I heard the tolling of distant bells. Taco Bells, and a glowing, almost neon, blue light started to pour in from nearly every crack and seam in the room. I heard the cans of Mountain Dew in my fridge explode. The various bags of chips and other junk foods started throbbing and pulsing. They too eventually burst open. I turned to my right and suddenly there was an open doorway where just seconds ago there was a blank wall. Fog filled it and it was lit by that same blue light. I couldn't make out anything past the entrance, but I knew this was my ticket to Flavortown. A man, (laughs) a man-sized shape formed in the fog that I could barely make out. It started to approach me and eventually stepped into my kitchen. The stories were true. The pizza puzzle had been solved and the mayor of Flavortown himself, Guy Fieri, was now in my house. (laughs) He looked different. He wasn't wearing the bowling shirt. Instead, he had on some kind of latex and leather contraption that did not fit him in the least. He was pouring out of the outfit, his blubber bursting through small square holes. Oh, the real creepy person. It almost looked like the holes were purposely tightened around the flesh as blood leaked from them and the skin was blackening as if dead. He had his trademark sunglasses on and the same hair, but his overall skin tone was now bluish gray. He had spatulas and other cooking implements tied around his considerable waist. What are you? I asked. An explorer in the further regions of taste, a demon to some, angels to others, He took a step towards me and extended his hand. Come, you solved the slice. You must come with me and taste our pleasures. I declined to take his hand, but I followed him nonetheless. We walked for what seemed like eons through labyrinthine corridors. (laughs) My my sense of smell was being constantly assaulted by new and varied scents. Some amazing. Some so bad I couldn't even imagine what they could be coming from. The corridor finally opened into a wide plateau. Above everything, there was a gigantic floating burrito. It was impossibly large and could be the origin of the various food food smells. Flavortown seemed like it would be a lot nicer than this when I heard the stories. The burrito let out a loud blast of sound, almost like something from a foghorn. My mind could barely comprehend what I was seeing. No, this is mine. The god I serve in this world and yours. The god of flavor, hunger, and grease. My god, Burrython, lord of Flavortown. I gasped for air. The stench of this massive, shifting burrito was starting to overpower me starting to make me have flashbacks of meals past. This is what you wanted. This is what you wanted to taste, to smell. You wanted a one-way ticket to Flavortown and now you have one, Guy shouted and chuckled. Behind me, I heard a noise, like greased up ball bearings moving a slab of wood. Guy took a step towards me and declared, my god wants someone to taste what it's created and i brought you 
He shoved me hard in the chest, and I fell back, landed immediately in what appeared to be an open, upright coffin of some kind. Something restrained my arms and legs. I had a split second to look down, and I saw oversized forks and spoons holding me in place. A sharp, stabbing pain erupted from my side, and I saw a tube full of what looked like Crisco impaling my side, pumping me full of the substance. More spoons and forks held my head in place with my mouth open. An arm made of what looks to be sausage and bacon dropped down in front of my face, jamming itself down my throat. I couldn't breathe. The smells and pain were overwhelming. I blacked out. I awoke being held at a 45 degree angle, still restrained, although now my head was free to look around for all the good that it did me. The room was nearly pitch black. Guy approached me with a grin plastered on his cold face. He removed his sunglasses and I saw that his eyes were sewn shut. Uh. I gave up a lot to become what I am now. Sight is meaningless to me, so I cast it off. It's all about that taste, brother. <laughs> I'm, going <laughs> I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the light, and then you're going to join my culinary cabal. I'm going to knock your socks off with this fresh take on a classic. When I put this in your mouth, you're going to feel like an ATM because this is money. <laughs> he stepped out of view and returned with a wheeled table, not unlike those you would see a cadaver on in the morgue. It was covered in macaroni and cheese. He took a large spoon off his belt and thrust it into the heaping mound, then turned to me and shoved it into my mouth with a dispassionate look. The spoon shattered one of my teeth. He loudly shouted, ka -ching! <sighs> Through the blood and enamel, I could taste the cheesy mess. My sanity must have started to slip because it really did taste good. After I swallowed, <laughs> he filled my mouth again immediately. This time it tasted slightly different, better somehow. There was a hint of something that I couldn't quite place. I chewed more and realized that it was bacon. I looked at Guy and he grinned again. You're tasting that bacon yet? It really kicks it up a notch, huh? <laughs> he started making sucking sounds with his mouth then smacked his lips, belched, and ate some of the mac and cheese himself. That bacon is made of long pig, if you know what I'm saying. I looked down and saw that strips of flesh were cut from my torso and legs. Uh, this and many more horrors were to be my fate for all eternity. It looks like I got myself into nothing but trouble. What? Like, that was so stupid that it made me so uncomfortable. Like, I feel a little <laughs> ill. I love the uh, I love the genre one too. The you know the the, the comedy horror punch. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, that really that really got me going. Ooh, <laughs> like I feel like a bit ill. Like it reminded me actually. It triggered a memory of um a nightmare I had when I was a kid of being like. It was like triggered. I had this nightmare because I watched a Simpsons episode where like Homer goes to hell and is force fed donuts forever. And like I had this nightmare about being force fed and it oh, like yeah, it like yeah. it triggered it fully triggered how uh, like afraid and like out yeah. of control I felt as a kid. I know it was like oh oh like mm. don't bring that back. But then it's like you tasted that bacon yet, brother, and I'm just laughing again. Like I'm so <laughs> confused about how I feel. <laughs> What's the tone? What's the tone? What's the tone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I, it's all about the power of flavor. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to Flavor Town. You to, asked for it. Oh, I ate a burrito yes. yesterday. I can taste it again. Oh no! <laughs> I, the bit that really killed me was when you said the burrito made a noise. <laughs> yeah, like a fog horn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was like MLG. <laughs> <laughs> Rice. That's literally the only creepy pasta I've ever heard before today. So uh, that <gasps> macaroni sounded like some creepy pasta. Oh, yeah. 
I never made that connection before. <laughs> oh no, you didn't. Oh uh, yes, I did. I recommend reading reading the Be- uh, Ben Drowned Creepy Pasta. Oh. That was one of the first ones I was inter- it introduced to. It's just it was way too long for me to read on mm-hmm. this episode, but um. Uh, that's a really creepy one. That, I like that one. The, like the the details are well presented. The the like the possibility of it is is quite high. And like, it's yeah. It just there's a bunch of different like peaks of creepiness. It um, it really yeah. helps that like fans of the creepy pasta have uh, be- remade scenes from the um from the creepy pasta in modded versions of the game. Yeah, there's video um. Uh, accompaniment like refer- yeah okay, yeah 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 it's uh it's pr- it's, it's uh, for the uninitiated it's a legend of zelda creepy pasta um yeah it's uh yes. it's a uh, it's about a haunted copy of majora's mask it's, yeah uh, yep. this this guy this guy goes to a uh, garage sale and sees a really cheap copy of uh, majora's mask the legend of zelda game and that the guy keeps on like lowering the price so that he'll buy it and just like yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I like how oh, a lot of the, those video game ones always start with like a shifty garage sale uh, <laughs> you know always some shifty dude trying mm-hmm. to get rid of his haunted game in, in his uh, yard yeah. or something Yeah, because in, his... <laughs> in, every, in every kid's heart they're worried that their parents are going to sell their Nintendo 64 while they're <laughs> out of the house or something <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah well, this has been very spooky. Yeah, that. Hell yeah. 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 Follow us on Instagram. We have an email address now. It's aneurysmpodcast at gmail.com. Um, we're going to be uploading the photos from our discussions of uh, European magpies versus Australian magpies onto Instagram, as well as the cute otters versus the terrified ones. You can find that on our Instagram as well if you're dying to follow us. Don't forget, you can't have a top text without a bottom text. Yeah. Happy Halloween. Have fun. Stay hydrated. <laughs>